Hello, everyone. Gonna wait for a few more people to join in. Why aren't we exceeding 20 viewers? All right, I'm going to start. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you had a nice vacation. Um, I had a really nice vacation. Um, so a couple of announcements. First of all, I want to remind you that the midterm is uh, open at this time. The midterm is due next, um, uh, this coming Monday. All right. Um, on the schedule, I have uh, two lessons for this week, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because I was looking at what I plan to teach, and um, today's lesson is a little bit, was a little bit long, so I'm doing today's lesson, the lesson that I plan to do just today, I'm doing it over two days, so you're only going to have one quiz for this week. Um, so that's going to give you a little bit of extra of um, less work because of the midterm. So I think that'll be good. Um, so, so what that means is that after today's lesson, there's going to be a quiz for you, but you won't know how to do every question. Okay, so um, I will um, in the Zoom room, I'll let you know which questions you know how to do, uh, you will know how to do at this point. Um, the third thing I wanted to talk about is um, uh, office hours on Friday. Uh, I will not be able to have office hours on Friday, so I'm just letting you know now if you have any questions for me, ask them either today during office hours or on uh, Thursday. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on my lesson. Um, so, uh, we're before the vacation, we learned about uh, gravitation and circular motion. And so now we're going to move on to another topic, which is called uh, rotational dynamics. So we're going to we're going to analyze things that are spinning. Okay. Um, and so today's lesson is about something called torque. Okay. Um, so what I want to imagine is you have a, a blob, okay? Here's a blob, some solid object, 
and that object has a pivot point. Okay, so there's the pivot point. So that means, you know, if this was the blob and there's the pivot point, it's rotating about, it, it can rotate about that um, point. Okay, and then we apply a force. So maybe I apply a force on the object at this location right here. So here's the force. It's called F. So uh, when we're talking about things rotating, where you apply the force is important. Okay, for rotating things, where you apply the force is just as important as how much force you apply and in what direction. Okay, so it matters that the force is applied at this location and not some other location. And we'll um, see how that works. In a moment. Um, so what is a torque? So when you apply this force, as a result, um, as a result of that, this blob is going to rotate. So for example, if, if this were the blob and the pivot point is right there and I apply an upward force at that location, so I apply an upward force there, you can see that it starts to rotate in the counterclockwise sense. So, um, and that's called a torque. Oh, excuse me. A torque is a, um, oops. a twisting force or a, a twisting action. Okay, um, so when I say a twisting force, it's it's not the same thing as a force. Okay, a torque is a distinct physical quantity, but it's a it's um, when you apply a force on something, you also exert a torque. So uh, one of the consequences of applying a force on something is you also get a torque. Okay, um, so the torque is quantifying. A force is quantifying how much push you're putting on the object. A torque is quantifying how much twist you're putting on the object as a result of that force. Okay? Um, so, now one of the things that... Um, okay, so maybe I should just give you the, the um, formula for torque. So torque is denoted by uh, the Greek letter tau. So this is, um, it looks like a T. This is the Greek letter tau, T-A-U. Um, and the formula for torque is F perp times R. So this is the formula that we are going to be dealing with today. And so let me go over what each of these, um, what this means, all right? So R is um, the distance from the pivot to where the force is applied. Okay, so here's the pivot. Here's where the force is applied. So whatever that distance is right there, that would be R. Okay. Um, all right. F perp. So if, if we look at this line here, so one, once I measure R, you can see that it's defined this line. And so now that I have this line, I have part of the force is, um, is perpendicular to that line. 
and part of the force is parallel to that line. So see how uh, I make a little force triangle, and this leg of the force triangle is parallel to that line, so that's called F parallel, and this component is perpendicular. So when I say F perp, okay, I mean the component of the force that is perpendicular to the line connecting the pivot and where the force is applied. Okay, um, so I, I draw this line that connects the pivot to where the force is applied. I measure the length of that line, and that's R. And then I find the component of the force that is perpendicular to that line, and that's F perp. All right, so uh, you can see this involves a triangle. So to, um, to get that component, you're going to be using a sine or a cosine. In most cases, you'll be using a sine or cosine, so we'll be using trigonometry to do that. All right? Um, so, what makes a torque large? Okay? What makes the torque large? So we can see that torque is F perp times R. So one of the things that makes a torque large is if R is large. So we can see that the bigger R is, the larger the torque, because you're multiplying F perp by a bigger and bigger number. Okay. So what does that mean if R is large? That means uh, you apply a force far from the pivot. Okay? So the, the further you apply the force from the pivot, so it would actually be better to apply the force further out, as far out as you can, to get as much torque as possible, if that's what you want it to do. Okay? Um, this is why wrenches are designed the way that they are, okay? Um, let's say I'm trying to twist this um, pen, okay? If I try to twist it just by grabbing the pen like that, you can see that I'm applying a force on the edge of the, um, the pen, which is very close to the pivot because the pen is very narrow. Okay, so I don't have a lot of torque when I twist that way. However, if I use a wrench, now I'm applying the force, you know, well, here, far from the, the pivot, so I can really get a lot of torque and twist the, um, the pen easily. Um, so, yeah, exactly. The, so uh, that was my next question. Um, so I, what I was going to ask, and it's been already answered in the chat, um, is what do, what do you call it when a force is applied far from the pivot? And when that happens, you would say, um, you have leverage. Okay. Exactly. Um, so good catch. Um, Another place where you can see leverage in action is um, in a bicycle, okay? Dang, I just moved my bicycle out of this room into the garage. Um, but if you think about the gears on a bicycle, you know, you, you have the gears on um, the bicycle. So, you know, maybe uh, here's the wheel of the bicycle. And then you have the center, which is the pivot point of the wheel, okay, because it rotates about that point. 
and then you have some gears. Maybe you have big gear and you have small gear, okay? Um, if the chain is connected to the big gear, the chain is pulling on it with the tension, okay? Um, and if, if you're pulling with the, if you have the um, chain connected to the big gear, you have a larger R value than if you have the chain connected to the small gear, okay? So, so um, the reason that it's easy to pedal in certain gears and hard to pedal in another gear, it's easy to pedal in a certain gear if the chain has a lot of leverage on the wheel, okay? Um, it has a larger R value, um, okay? Now there is a trade-off because as you know, if you're on a bike and it's really easy to pedal, uh, you usually are going to be going slower, right? So the trade-off is while it makes it easier to pedal, you can't spin the wheel as quickly. All right, so there's a trade-off between torque and rotation rate. Um, but that's, that's the idea behind changing gears in a car. Um, or in a, in, a, in a car and in a bicycle. Um, the other thing that makes a torque large is if you make the force as perpendicular as possible. Okay, so um, let's suppose that I have... Um, so we, I'm going to say, make the force as perpendicular as possible. Okay. Um, so imagine that we're trying to open a door, for example. So let's, let's imagine sort of like the top view of a door. Okay, so here's here's the top of the door. Um, here's the hinge, which is basically the pivot point. And we apply a force right here at this location. All right. So we have a bunch of forces of equal size. We, all right. Um, so all these forces, all these force arrows have the same length, so they're all the same size, okay? But um, which force, even though they all have the same size, they're all exerting different torques on the, um, on the door, okay? And the reason is they have different degrees of perpendicularness to the door, all right? So if we think about, uh, I'm just going to number them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we look at force five here, force five is completely perpendicular to the door. All right. So this one is going to exert the most torque. Okay. Um, so these are the two things that maximize. The so, uh, hey, look, there's a door. Let's talk about this door. All right. So um, let's suppose I want to close this door as strongly as possible, okay? The door pivots. I'm going to make this full screen, actually. Um, the door pivots about its hinge. So when I measure R, R stands for the distance from the hinges, so the distance horizontally across the door, okay? So if I want to close the door as strongly as possible, I should push the opposite side of the door from the hinge, okay? Like that. And in fact, that is one of the reasons why the door handle is on the opposite side of the door from the hinge. You would never put the door handle right here. That would be craziness, all right? Because you don't have enough leverage. Um, you can try it yourself. Try closing your bedroom door by pushing really close to the hinge, and it's, it's quite difficult, okay? Um, the other thing is, I want to make my applied force as perpendicular as possible. 
So I'm going to push perpendicular to the face of the door as far from the hinge as possible. And that's going to be the strongest push. Um, it's not as strong if I push not perpendicular to the door. So what if I push at an angle to the door like this? It doesn't close very easily um, at all. All right? Uh, in fact, uh, what if what if I pull parallel to the face of the door? So I'm going to apply a force directly towards you guys, and I apply a force parallel to the door. Nothing happens. It doesn't rotate at all. Okay? Um, so to maximize the torque, you want your force to be perpendicular to the door, far from the pivot. So actually, forces 1 and 8, um, because they're parallel to the door, they exert. So this is the most torque. And because this one is parallel, it actually exerts 0 torque. All right? Um, so there's some discussion. Um, Some tea. Okay, so one of the things we notice is that certain forces will cause the object to rotate counterclockwise. So, for example, uh, let's look at this force right here. Uh, if I imagine this being the blob and this being the pivot point, if I push up over here, the blob is going to rotate counterclockwise. Okay, um, so the, the sign of a torque refers to which direction is it going to cause it to rotate in, clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay, um, so a torque is positive if it would tend to make the object rotate counterclockwise, which I'm calling CCW. Did you know that they call counterclockwise anti-clockwise in England. I think that sounds kind of cool, anti-clockwise. Um, so counterclockwise or anti-clockwise, whichever way you want to think about it. Uh, if the force would tend to rotate um, the object in the clockwise sense, it is negative. All right? So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to so this is important. So uh, what if this is my object? All right, here's the pivot point. I'm pinning it down right here. And I'm going to apply a force that's upward and to the left right on the end of the pen, like that. OK, so would that be a positive or a negative torque? Which way does the object rotate as a result of me applying this force? Type it in the chat if you know. Is that a, clock, uh, a clockwise or a counterclockwise? Positive or negative torque? I'm just repeatedly applying that torque. Excellent. Yeah, that's a negative torque. Um, because when I, when I push up on the left-hand side, it rotates in the clockwise sense. So that would be a negative torque. Excellent. Um, we should talk about units of torque. Um, so torque, remember square brackets stands for units. Uh, torque is a force times a distance. So the units of torque are Newton meters. All right? Newton meters are the units of torque. Although, if we are talking about um, engines, uh, this is the metric unit of torque. But if you're, if you're talking about like car engines or boat engines, for example, uh, typically the torque is stated in different units in imperial units okay so uh, you know the miles type unit 
So I'm going to ask you guys, does anyone know what is the unit of torque used in the automotive industry? Does anyone know? Type it in, in the chat if you know. Sometimes you will hear this on, um, on like truck commercials. As I wait, I will sip some tea. I think no one knows. No one knows. All right. Nosotros no sabemos. See. Okay, that, that's that's a good one. Uh, it's actually foot pounds. Anyone ever heard of foot pounds? Sometimes in uh, car commercials, it'll be like, you know, it'll show like a Ford truck going over some boulders or something. And then there'll be some guy with a gravelly voice and he'll be like, oh, this, this truck can do 400 foot pounds of torque. Um, so foot pounds. Sounds kind of funny. Because why is it foot pounds? Uh, well, foot is basically the same thing as meter. Uh, it's the English unit, the imperial unit of distance is foot. And uh, the imperial unit of force is pound. So it's foot pounds. All right. Um, horsepower. So there, there are basically uh, two important, um, in terms of the performance of an engine, there are two important quantities. One is the torque. So the torque is basically saying how strongly is the engine twisting the drive shaft, okay? And twisting the drive shaft, that um, torque is transferred to the wheels. So how strongly are the wheels being twisted, okay? Um, so in, in order for a car to, uh, or a truck to tow something, it has to have a large torque because when it has a large torque, it twists the wheels strongly, um, which results in your ability to pull something that's very heavy. Uh, the other factor that determines the quality of the engine is horsepower, uh, which is measuring how much, uh, how quickly can the engine output energy, all right? So you, you can have, um, and, and these two are, are distinct from each other. They're related, obviously, but... Um, uh, but you can have you can have cars that you know have a lot of horsepower but don't output a lot of torque, okay, and vice versa. All right. Um, so there's something called the net torque, which is just the the sum of the individual torques that are acting on the object. So torque one plus torque two plus torque three taking into account their signs, all right? Um, so you do this calculation, and if, if you find that the net torque on the object is greater than zero, then what that means is as a result of all of those forces, the object will rotate in the counterclockwise sense, okay? If you find that the net torque is negative, less than zero, you will find that the object will rotate clockwise. Uh, if you find that the net torque is zero, then it won't rotate. It'll just maintain the same orientation, okay? So that is, um, this one is really important in engineering because um, when you're designing something, you wanna make sure 
if it's a structure that's meant to stay still, um, then uh, you obviously want it to not rotate. Okay. So why is the Leaning Tower of Pisa, why does it lean a little bit? It's because at some time in the past, there was a net torque which caused it to rotate. And I believe that they have, um, they have done some engineering on the Leaning Tower of Pisa to make sure that the net torque is going to stay zero and it won't continue to rotate further. Um, okay. All right, so let's do a couple of examples. Um, all right. Uh, so here's an example. Um, so let's suppose we have a blob. Okay, here's the blob. Um, and here's the pivot point of the blob. And the blob has some forces acting on it. It's got a force acting right here. Uh, it's got a force acting um, right here. It's got a force acting right here. And it's got a force acting right here. Okay, so I haven't, I've j I haven't drawn what the forces are. I've just drawn where they're acting. Okay, so force one is acting right there. So force one is 300 newtons. Okay, and uh, this, I'm going to tell you right now that this angle right here is 40 degrees. Okay, um, force two is right here. Force 2 is 100 newtons and it's acting straight downward. Uh, force 3 is right here and it has a size of 900 newtons. Okay and I'm going to tell you that this angle right here is 60 degrees. And then force 4 is 2,000 newtons. And it's acting, it's just pointed to the left. Okay. So I, I didn't have to give the angles for these two because they're, you know, cardinal directions, basically, north, south, east, west. Um, in order to calculate torque, you also need to know the distances from the pivot. So uh, let me give you these distances. This distance right here is 2 meters. OK. Um, this distance right here is uh, let's say 0 0.5 meters. This is not to scale, okay? This distance right here is 1.5 meters. And this distance right here is 1 meter, okay? And so uh, what I would like to calculate is what is the net torque? as a result of these forces, okay? So there are, there are obviously um, four forces, so I'm going to get four torques. So the net torque is going to be T1, tau 1 plus tau 2 plus tau 3 plus tau 4, okay? Um, now let's just go around and let's figure out the signs of each of these torques, okay? Um, so I'm going to imagine that this is the blob, okay? And there's the pivot point over here. Force 1 is acting up and to the right, and it's to the right of the pivot point. So it's like right here. I push like that. You can see that as a result of that push, 
the pen will tend to rotate in the counterclockwise sense. So this is a positive torque, okay? Um, let's do the same thing for force two. Here's the pivot point. Force two is acting downward to the right of the pivot. So I push downward and I can see that that makes it rotate in the, um, in the clockwise sense. So torque two is negative. All right. Uh, if I look at force three, here's the blob. Here's the pivot point right here. And I push above the pivot to the right. And I can see that as a result of that, the pen starts to rotate in the clockwise sense. So that is a negative torque. All right. And then let's look at uh, force four. Um, if this is the pivot, here's the pivot right here. Force four is acting to the left of the pivot and in a direction that's to the left. So if I pull, notice how the pen doesn't rotate at all when I, when I pull to the left, okay? Why is that? Well, because this force is parallel to that line. So that's analogous to the example of me trying to close the door by applying a force parallel to the door, all right? So um, this torque is zero, all right? And that is because F4 is a parallel force. So uh, you can be exerting a huge force, but if that force is not pointed in the right direction, it will not create a torque, okay? So that's an important point. Um, all right, so I'm going to put these in as uh, with their signs. Okay, so uh, why did I put two sets of parentheses for each one? Uh, so there's a question, why is torque 2 negative uh, if it is pointing down but not slanting at an angle? So it doesn't matter which direction the force is pointed. What, what you do is you imagine applying that force to an object. So, so it depends on where is that force applied and what direction does it have relative to the pivot. Okay. So if this is my pivot, if I apply a downward force to the right of the pivot, it causes it to go in the clockwise sense. So that is a negative torque. Um, so the reason I have two sets of parentheses for each of these terms is because the formula for torque is F perp times R. All right, F perp times R. So I have an F perp times R for each of these. All right, except for the fourth one because I already know that's zero. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and do R for each force. So force one acts two meters from the pivot. So that means that this is two. Okay. Uh, force two acts 0 0.5 meters from the pivot. So that means that this is 0 0.5. And force three acts 1.5 meters from the pivot. So this distance right here, 1.5. All right. So now I've got to figure out F per. So for force one, you can see here is the line that is um, connecting the pivot to where the force is applied. So F per, by definition, is the component of the force that's perpendicular to that line. So per, that you can see this line is horizontal. So what's perpendicular to horizontal is vertical. So this component of the force right here is F perp. All right. So we can see that that 
side of the tr of the force triangle here is adjacent to the angle. The trig function with adjacent in it is cosine. So F perp in this case is 300 cosine of 40 degrees. All right. Let's look at F2. F2. Uh, we we saw that it's it's um, sometimes this this direction here is called the direction of the lever arm. So the lever arm is horizontal here. All right. Um, and the force is vertical, which is perpendicular to it. So notice how the force is already perpendicular. So when a force is already perpendicular, you don't need to do the trigonometry. Okay. So I would just put in, because it's already perpendicular, I just put in 100 with no trig function. So there are two cases where you don't need to do the trigonometry. One is if the force is already perpendicular, and the other is if the force is already parallel, in which case F perpendicular is zero. Okay, so I'm going to put a little note here. It's already perpendicular, no trig required. Um, and then if we look at F3, uh, the lever arm for F3 is vertical because the force is applied above the pivot. So what's perpendicular to um, vertical is horizontal. So for this third force, this is going to be F perp. Oops. This is going to be F perp. And we can see that that's opposite to the angle that I've given you. So that would be sine. Okay. So it's going to be 900 sine of 60 degrees. Um, one of the things that's funny here is that this is the biggest force. This is 2,000 newtons, but it exerts the smallest torque. Okay, so keep that in mind. A big force does not necessarily mean a big torque. So um, let me crunch the numbers here. Um, and we get a net torque of negative uh, 760 newton meters as our final answer. So what does that mean? It means that as a result of, provided that these are truly all of the torques acting on the object, um, uh, okay, provided those are the only torques, this object is going to rotate clockwise. Uh, let me do one more example, just really quickly. Um, let's suppose we have a balance beam. So here's the floor. All right. Um, and then here's a balance beam. So the balance beam is pivoting about its center. All right. And on one side of the balance beam, we have a three kilogram mass. And, and that mass is uh, two meters from the pivot. Okay. Um, and then on the other side, we have a two kilogram mass, which is four meters from the pivot. So this distance right here is four meters. All right. Um, so let's just go ahead and calculate the net torque, first of all, in this situation. So um, uh, if you have a three kilogram mass, it's pushing down on the beam with its weight force. So there's a downward 30 Newton force on the beam due to this one. Okay, so that's mg, all right? 
over here we have a downward force of uh, 20 newtons because that would be mg for a 2 kilogram object. All right. Um, so as it stands, and, and then furthermore, um, so let's, let's talk about that in a second. Uh, so if, if this is the pivot point right here, uh, the three kilogram mass is pushing down to the right of the pivot. So that caused it to rotate in the um, clockwise sense, okay? So this one is a negative torque, all right? And then uh, this two kilogram mass over here is pushing downward left of the pivot, which creates a counterclockwise rotation. So this one does a positive torque, all right? So the net torque is going to be F perp times R plus F perp times R. So it's going to be um, the positive one. So 20 is the force times 4 is the distance. Minus the torque due to the other one, which is um, 30 newtons, which is the force, times 2, which is the distance. Okay. And that gives 80 minus 60 is 20 newton meters is the net torque. Okay. Uh, type it into the chat if you know why did I not have to use any trig functions in this problem. Okay. Why didn't I have, you know, 20 sine of something or 20 cosine of something? All right. Uh, yeah. So now... Let's suppose we have a five kilogram block. And we're gonna put that block wherever we want. Okay, so the question is, where should the five kilogram block be put in order to balance the beam? Excellent, I see a lot of you have typed in. The forces are already perpendicular, very good. Um, so I don't have to do trig for those. Uh, if the beam was, so this is a horizontal beam, if the beam was slanted or something like that, you know, then the forces would still be downward. So I, I would have to worry about directions, um, but it's a horizontal beam, thankfully. Okay, so where should I put that five kilogram mass? Well, um, the five kilogram mass Uh, will create, or I, I should say, uh, in order to make the beam balance, the net torque has to be zero. So this five kilogram mass had better create a torque, needs to create a torque that is negative 20 newton meters because it's got to cancel out the torque that's already there okay um so the formula for torque so by the way uh it's it's clear that anything that's placed on the right side of the beam is going to push down and cause the thing to rotate um, clockwise so because it needs to exert a negative torque it's going to be on the right side of the um, beam, okay? And then, so we want 20 equals F times R, all right? The force that a five kilogram mass will exert is gonna be 50 newtons, all right? So dividing by 50 gives R equals 0 0.4 meters. So we wanna put uh, the five kilogram mass, 0 0.4 meters to the right of the pivot, and that will cause it to balance. All right. Um, so that is my lesson for today, and I will see you in the Zoom room.